morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Kareem Black, and welcome to Risk Management Professionals webinar series. Our producers, Max Opadal and Jasmine Dhaliwal, will be in the background keeping us operational and taking questions. Today, we're using a GoToWebinar interface to support our presentation. If you experience any technical difficulties, please contact our office at 877-532-0806. We have staff available to help with troubleshooting. Uh, the image sizes for your presenter screen and PowerPoint presentation are also adjustable. And we have a dialog box for questions. If you have any questions during the presentation, please submit them on the question box. And after the presentation, we will include them in the question and answer section. This webinar series is part of RMP's ongoing outreach program. Um, some of our core competencies and expertise reside in EPA RMP, OSHA PSM, CalRP, and SENS program development, as well as HAZOP and LOPA studies and other hazard identification techniques, and a variety of other process safety and regulatory standards. Here's a list of the topics I will be discussing today. Uh, first will be what to know about HAZOP studies and how to be prepared. Next, I will be discussing several common causes used in these studies. And then I, finally, I will discuss mistakes to avoid when developing HAZOP causes. I will then conclude with an interactive question answer session to address any questions that may arise during my presentation. So what to know about the HAZOP methodology and how to be prepared. First, um, what is a HAZOP? For those of you that don't know, HAZOP stands for Hazard and Operability Study. The primary purpose of the HAZOP study is to identify potential process hazards and major operability problems and evaluate the effects of these hazards in a qualitative approach while determining whether the safeguards against these potential hazards appear adequate. So the causes we will be discussing today are those potential process hazards um, that are identified by a HAZOP team. This team should consist of a range of people knowledgeable in the chemical process being discussed as well as a facilitator with experience using the HAZOP methodology. The overall objective is, of this study is to reduce or eliminate the risk of hazards, and this could impact a wide variety of things, such as the most obvious being health and safety, as this is a major concern for facilities with hazardous chemicals, but you also want to, the study team to discuss uh, risk to the environment or any um, of the facility's assets or any financial impact, as well as any hazards to image and reputation. In order to address these hazards, a systematic approach to the hazard methodology is often used called the guide word technique. This is accomplished by using words such as no and low and more and high and so on and applying them to design parameters such as flow, temperature, pressure, and level. Combining these creates the deviation you can use to define your causes. Examples of this being a low flow deviation can be caused by a valve being inadvertently closed. I will later go through go through each major deviation and discuss some potential causes. Now, here I just have a sample HAZOP worksheet to give you guys a better idea of what is involved in the overall HAZOP process. In order to develop a cause, you want to first select the deviation that is being discussed. In this case, I just chose no flow, and then develop your cause. Um, from there, once the cause is established, the team will discuss the ultimate consequence without crediting any safeguards, and then rank the severity. Once they do this, the team can then move on to addressing safeguards, discussing the likelihood of the event, and then giving the scenario an overall ranking. If the ranking is outside of the scope of what is considered acceptable for industry, recommendations should be made to eliminate the risk. Once all of this is completed, you can then move on to discussing your next cause. So moving on to how to be prepared. Knowing the kinds of things that are going to be discussed during a HAZOP, um, is helpful because it makes you have a more organized and efficient HAZOP. This saves time and also includes, improves the quality of the product since session time can be spent brainstorming scenarios that are more unique to the facility, such as non-routine situations like startup and shutdown. So the best way to prepare is to first have accurate piping and instrumentation diagrams, or PNIDs. Inaccurate PNIDs can lead to inaccurate HAZOPs as a majority of the study will be spent referencing these drawings. And if there are inconsistencies, they can be reflected in the HAZOP. Um, next is selecting and highlighting study notes on the PNIDs. This should be done going along with the flow of the process as much as possible to make following along very simple. Um, once everything is noted, the team can also move on to identifying causes. It is best to address these causes throughout the node before moving on to consequences, safeguards, and risk ranking. This is because safeguards and consequences could appear in numerous places on the PNIDs, and you don't want the team to get sidetracked um, when they backtrack and miss some causes. 
finally, it is good to have additional design information available during the study. Um, this could include set points of PSVs, alarms and shutdowns, and all the design parameters for equipment, such as maximum allowable working pressures, and so on. Now I will begin discussing the common causes in hazard studies. So first, there are several types of causes to look out for. Um, one would be human error, such as not following operating procedures. This could be an operator inadvertently opening a valve or something of that sort, or not maintaining equipment and allowing things to foul or corrode. Um, another type of cause to look out for is control system malfunctions, like instrument leak failure, which could be transmitter failure, loss of instrument error, and so on. And then finally, mechanical failures are also very commonly seen. Uh, these could be things like pressure relief valves, failing open um, pumps, failing to operate, or even heat exchanger tube ruptures. So keeping these three different types of causes in mind, I will now discuss some common causes in each deviation I was mentioning earlier. So the first one is low or no flow deviations. Common causes in this deviation are things such as block or control valves malfunctioning or being inadvertently closed. This could be inadvertent closure by an operator or a mechanical failure, possibly due to loss of power. Um, it is also important to note, note while discussing valves malfunctioning, whether they are normally closed or normally open, as well as their fail-safe positions. Um, a good PNID would indicate these things. And knowing these positions is just valuable to focus the team's attention on what the actual issue is in each scenario that is being discussed. Um, other causes in a low flow deviation are often control loop failures, um, pumps or blowers failing to operate, or equipment getting plugged or fouled. This could be filters, strainers, heat exchangers, and so on. Moving on to the high flow deviation. Uh, some so common causes here are block or control valves being fully opened. Again, um, control loop failures or a bypass valve being inadvertently opened. And there are also a number of things that occur with pumps or blowers, such as pump overspeeding or being activated when not needed. Or oftentimes, facilities also have pumps operating in parallel with only one operating at a time. Um, so if both were to be activated, that could also create a high flow scenario. Um, the next thing I'll be discussing is reverse or misdirected flow deviations. Um, causes of reverse flow oftentimes occur in areas with check valves. So while check valves failing to seat are not often considered the actual cause, they do appear in situations where there is potential for reverse flow hazards, such as on the discharge of pumps and compressors or at tie-in points for processes. So they are good indicators for what the cause might be. So it is important to check out for or look out for check valves on the PNIDs and just make sure that there aren't there isn't any potential for reverse flow that appears hazardous. Um, additionally, I have several misdirected flow causes that are common, such as um, tube rupturing on a heat exchanger or a condenser and so on, or a loading hose decoupling or leaking, or even incorrectly aligning um, loading hoses, such as placing the liquid line. Um, on the vapor line outlet or so on, um, or even just mis uh, misaligning things to a grid. Um, facilities also frequently have pressure relief or safety valves that can fail open when not needed, or uh, the team can also discuss bypass valves being inadvertently open as this is a separate pathway that it is um, taking. So next is high or low pressure deviations. Um, it's important to note for this that a lot of these causes were already discussed during the high and low flow deviations. And just to ensure that there aren't any discrepancies in your HAZOP, um, uh, generally these causes should only be discussed in one of the deviations. Um, so if you already have discussed this cause um, in a flow situation, it's acceptable to just say no new causes. Um, so now some common high pressure causes include pump overspeeding, uh, control valves failing open, uh, control loop failure, or uh, thermal overpressure. In contrast, low pressure causes are things like pumps failing to operate, uh, control valves failing closed, again, control loop failures, and a block valve inadvertently being closed. Um, moving on to high or low level deviations. Some causes for high levels could be operator inadvertently overfilling a tank. Um, in contrast to that would be unloading from a low or empty tank. There could also be faulty level measurements, which could indicate either high or lower levels. Um, or the inlet block valve into a tank or the outlet block valve out of a tank could be open or closed to lead to high or lower scenarios depending on the situation. Um, and additionally, with several other deviations, there could also be control or 
control valve or control loop failures or issues with pumps, overspeeding, or failing to operate. Um, so there's a number of things going on. Um, next is high or low, flow, or low temperature deviations. Uh, causes for high temperature could be just high ambient temperature or foul heat exchanger tubes, loss of cooling or temperature control controller failures, or even thermal expansion issues within a tank, or um, cooler fan failure. In contrast to that would be low temperatures causing um, causes including low ambient temperature, fouled or failed heat exchanger tubes, uh, loss of heating, temperature control failure, or inadvertent activation of cooler fans. Finally, um, there are several miscellaneous causes that the team should make sure to discuss after looking into the common uh, causes that I just discussed. This could include catalyst degradation, corrosion, transient operations such as startup, shutdown, maintenance, and so on, loss of chemical injection or even too much chemical injection, or sampling issues, or anything that could be involved in the reaction, so too much reaction, too little reaction, any side reactions that could occur. Um, additionally, you want to touch on any human factors that could be involved that lead to risk or loss of utilities or any composition issues. Um, and if there's anything else that the team comes up with, you obviously want to add those as well. So now that I've gone over several of the common causes in each deviation, I thought I'd give you a brief example of a very basic simplified diagram just to go over the process the team would go through. Assuming that this is your note being discussed, the team could have, would start with no flow deviation and travel the direction of the process flow. Uh, so the first cause that would likely to be discussed is the block valve on the outlet of the storage tank being inadvertently closed. Then they, they would then discuss the pump, PO3 failing, or uh, the block valve after PO3 being inadvertently closed. Or further down the line, other causes for no flow could be um, the flow control valve um, being malfunctioning closed or one of the valves surrounding it being closed. And obviously on a good PNID, all relative equipment, relevant equipment um, should be labeled so that there's no confusion. Um, so once the team is confident that they've discussed all their no-flow scenarios, they would again go back through this same node and um, start discussing the more flow. So the team should make sure to again start at the beginning of the process path. So the first thing they would probably address would be the PO3 overspeeding. And then uh, maybe further down the line, they note the bypass valve could be inadvertently open and that the flow control valve could malfunction fully open and uh, both of those scenarios could cause more flow down the line. Um, so for examples of misdirected and reverse flow in this uh, little diagram, the, the first thing they would want to address would be the pressure relief valve located on the storage tank. This could fail open or loop by when not needed, leading to some misdirected flow. Um, additionally, as I mentioned earlier, it is important for the team to take note of any check valves. Um, this check valve could indicate that there is potential for reverse flow hazards in a line, possibly from the pump failing, so the team just needs to address this and make sure that there aren't any hazards involved in that situation. And then once the various flow deviations are discussed, the team can then move on to pressure level and temperature deviations. Uh, so in this diagram, potential pressure deviation causes could include pump overspeeding or failing again, or um, the flow control valve malfunctioning, either fully open or fully closed. Uh, for level deviations, this could be a faulty level indicator on the storage tank or an operator overfilling the tank, or even the valve on the outlet of the tank being inadvertently closed when it shouldn't be. So next would be temperature deviations. Uh, some causes of this could be things like thermal expansion, in the tank or even just high or low ambient temperatures. Again, several of these scenarios might have already been discussed in the flow deviation when you're actually discussing these things with the team, so just make sure to document them only in one location. Um, and then once all these deviations are discussed, along with any miscellaneous ones the facility or the team comes up with, um, you can finally move on to talking about your consequences. So now that I've gone over most of the common causes you'll see in any given facility, I wanted to address some mistakes to avoid while developing these causes. The first is using an accurate PNID. I know I mentioned this earlier, but it is important uh, to use accurate ones because this could potentially develop invalid causes. This could be from creating causes from equipment that doesn't exist anymore or is located in a different place in the process, or in contrast to that, neglecting equipment that does exist and not addressing any hazards that may be affiliated. 
Uh, next would be not developing causes in a logical manner. So this could be by not properly highlighting the note and noting the PNIDs or not following along the process pathway well when discussing all the causes. Um, and this could lead to either missing some information or, in contrast, repeating information. Um, you could also be repeating the causes in multiple deviations, which can lead to inconsistencies within the study and is also just a waste of the team's time. So next would be not discussing transient operations. A good number of industry incidents actually occur during these transient operations, so you do want to make sure to discuss it. And you wouldn't want to, for example, have some valve that is only used during startup or shutdown procedures be missed since it's not considered part of normal operations. So you do want to make sure to address any deviations there. Moving on, um, another mistake to other mistakes to avoid would be addressing scenarios that aren't either specific and credible. So one would be um, analyzing the double jeopardy scenario where multiple independent event failures are occurring simultaneously. Um, this is not considered credible and shouldn't be addressed. Or in contrast, generalizing causes so much that you don't know what is being discussed. So you always need to say more than just valve upstream of reactor, as this could refer to a number of things. Um, another one to avoid would be failing to analyze credible scenarios. So this could be a kind of considered a double jeopardy, but is in fact a valid scenario. An example would be a control loop failure calling, causing both valve V101A to open and VF, FV101B to close. This is only one failure, but there's also, uh, but has two valves closing, so it is still a credible scenario. And then finally, not putting enough detail into the causes. Everything I've been discussing today has been kind of just the basics um, for what you want to put, but when you're actually inputting it into your study, you want to be as precise as possible. So some mistakes to avoid would be not including tag numbers for equipment or also not discussing specific locations of this equipment. Um, an example of a really good, well-defined cause would be VF121 downstream of the zinc oxide unit, and then you want to name the unit and also the PNID where that um, piece of equipment is located on. Malfunctions fully open, possibly due to instrumentation malfunction. So obviously throughout this, you just want to input as much detail as possible. And also down the line, when you have to revalidate these, uh, that's helpful. Um, but overall, if you keep the causes I discussed today in mind, uh, it should help you prepare to efficiently use your time during the next HAZOP. Before I jump into questions, I would like to discuss some upcoming webinars as part of RMP's ongoing outreach program. Um, coming up in a couple weeks, we have IIAR standards and how they apply to RAGAGAP Part 5. Um, later on in the year, we also have some standard things, and, uh, some standards discussed, and also common MOC and PSSR deficiencies. So, if anyone has any questions, I will be happy to take them now. Okay. Uh, testing. Okay, so the first question is, you mentioned human factors. How do they usually develop causes for these kinds of issues? So a lot of times for those things, we use um, what-if checklists, so you can address things like, um, are there appropriate SDSs available to operators, or do you have a, uh, an appropriate preventative maintenance program and such, and the team can just discuss whether or not um, they think this is appropriate and evaluate if there are any hazards potentially there but it doesn't necessarily need like a full risk ranking. Um, next question. How do, you, um, how do you decide what deviation uh, cause should be discussed under? For example, when should, you, when should a cause be put into more pressure instead of more flow? Um, good question. So that is at the discretion of the team. They just want to make sure to be consistent. A lot of times, because we are already addressing our flow scenarios first, we put most of our causes in there so that we don't later on assume that it was discussed earlier and then accidentally miss it during a pressure, uh, like the no pressure scenario or something like that. Um, but it is whatever makes sense for the team. So as long as they're consistent and know what they're doing, um, you can just put it in whatever makes the most sense. That looks like that's all of our questions for today. All right, well, thank you very much.